incredible pleasure for me to introduce our next keynote speaker, Jim Everwine, who's been a close collaborator and friend. Jim and I have done many things together. We co-directed the Genomics Institute at Penn. We co-directed the Single Cell Institute. More recently, we've started this uh, Center for Subcellular <coughs> Genomics. So Jim and I actually have been working together for about 15 years or so. We just uh, submitted our 36th junior author paper. And it started because 15 years ago or so, Jim had this crazy idea that we could transdifferentiate cells by transfecting whole transcriptome of one cell into another cell, which kind of fitted in with my crazy thoughts that I had, which are coming from an evil Debo background, that how cell states might work, as Eric actually already discussed. And we did this experiment, and in Jim's lab, Jim, uh, basically, uh, lots of things were done, but main thing was that the, all the manipulations for the cells were done at individual cell level, so we necessarily had to do the assays at the single cell level as well. So what you see here, I think is, I would think the first single cell transcriptome done at multiple cell and multiple cell type level, we did about 30 different cells to show that in fact this transfection and transdifferentiation experiment allowed the individual cells to converge to each other's trans transcriptome state. But the more important thing here is that you can see that Jim's uh, facial morphology was considerably different from now. And this was me at back then. <laughs> and uh, this is current state. So there's some kind of conservation of uh, facial hair that, that happened. But uh, I mentioned that this was part. Terminal expansion. <laughs> <laughs> I mentioned that this might have been the first multi cell single cell transcriptomics done back then. But of course, Jim ha has been a pioneer in this field. In fact, in 1992, Jim actually did what we now call patch seek, which was to take live cells and actually put the content out with a micro uh, patch pipette, measure the EFIS, and then pull out and uh, do the trans uh, be able to do RNA amplification from the single cell. At that time, he had a little bit more facial hair back then and a little bit darker. That was me. So again, we have <laughs> <laughs> conservation of facial hair. <laughs> <laughs> then in 1990, of course, almost 30 years ago, Jim actually acquired the first single cell transcriptome way back then from a single Purkinje neuron. And I think uh, Jay Lee uh, already told you that in 1988, he, he uh, first published the in situ transcription paper. Again, 31 years ago, this in situ transcription paper. Now, it was pretty hard to find any picture for Jim from way back then, but, so I searched really hard in the archives and finally did find one. <laughs> so, so <laughs> this was Jim's facial morphology then. So I am really incredibly happy and honored to be able to introduce uh, my friend and truth pioneer, Jim Everwine. Thank you, Jin Young, and um, you know, I will always remember this. So, so it's just something to keep in mind. No, um, again, I, I think in concert with everyone, I want to thank the organizers for their kind invitation to speak. Now, this is a great meeting. I've always enjoyed coming to this meeting, and it's nice to see so many people here. Um, I think you already heard a little bit about the background, I think, from Scott and from Sonny, who gave the first keynote, but this was... Is there a... Clicker? Oh, okay. So, thank you. Um, so this was a program for the first meeting, and so it was held in Plimpton Conference Room, as I think you all were aware. I like showing this because I actually did this myself. Cold Spring Harbor didn't do it, um, and um, and so. In thinking about the courses, though, and thinking about the workshops, you know, even though. Scientists propose these and, and organize them. You have to get Cold Spring Harbor's buy-in. And that's really one of the most important aspects about thinking about being at a meeting like this or at the courses. It's Cold Spring Harbor's vision of the future of science that allows these things to move forward. So the people who were most important in setting up this um, conference or this workshop, all the workshops and all the courses, are Terry Grotziker, 
David Stewart, John Inglis, and Bruce Stillman. Um, you've probably seen David here at some of the talks, and, and it's their insight, and they're, they're, they're looking towards the future that allow these workshops and courses to move forward. So I think we all owe them a debt of gratitude to, just as all of science does for all the workshops that, that go on here. Um, but to put this in a little bit of perspective, so the first course was in 2009. What are some of the things that were happening in 2009? So the iPhone 3G was introduced. For those of you who are gamers, Minecraft was introduced, and the first Bitcoin was sold. Um, I figured David is watching this on TV, so I put this in. Michael Jackson died, but David is, oh, David's over there, yes. So um, Susan Boyle won Britain's Got Talent, so David is it's sort of his British heritage. Um, Pittsburgh Steelers won the Super Bowl, the Yankees won the World Series, and Barack Obama was inaugurated. What this last point is, with his, Barack Obama's campaign slogan was, was hope. And so that's sort of where the single cell course comes into play. And I'm sorry, these are pixelated, low resolution. I just did not have high resolution photos of this. But this is Sunny Z, um, as you know, on your left, looking at a caricature, caricature that was drawn of him. And then on the right-hand side, you can see the Plimpton Conference Room with some of the participants. And you can see Scott with, you know, towards your, your, your right. And Jun Young is actually in the back of the room. But again, you can see Scott is sitting in the front row. And where is Scott today? Right there in the front row. Um, but in terms of thinking about hope and, and the, the single cell analysis issues, um, we, at that point, you, we could only analyze a few cells at a time. And we only had 47 attendees. So five years later, in 2013, this was the last one that, um, workshop that I organized, um, we had 115 attendees, and we were able to do thousands of cells simultaneously. Um, in keeping with looking where our current organizers are, Jun Young is there, Nancy, who's unfortunately not able to be here, is, is there, and of course, all the way over on your far right is Scott. Now, he's not in the first row, but of course, he's above everyone, so still standing <laughs> out, and then this is still the case. Um, but then in thinking about this workshop today, um, there are 246 attendees, and we can do millions of cells in terms of analysis. So I think there's a tight correlation between the number of attendees at this meeting and the number of cells that one can actually analyze. <laughs> so there's one bit of data that comes out of the meeting. Um, one of the other things is a couple of years after the first um, um, workshop was developed, we started a single cell analysis course. This is a two-week course at Coral Spring Harbor for hands-on um, um, doing of these techniques, uh, such as tra transcriptomics and genomic DNA sequencing. Um, currently, the instructors are Mike McConnell, Gene Yao, and David Chenowitz. And for those of you who want your students or you yourself might want to learn some of these other technologies, I'd encourage you to apply and come to the course. It's a great course, and you'll learn a lot. And again, Coral Spring Harbor has been great in terms of thinking about how to promote fields and move science along worldwide by offering these courses. So now in terms of the science. And so I was under the impression that I had an hour for this. It turns out I have 45 minutes. So what that means is I'm going to go through slides very quickly, even more quickly than I normally do. So, uh, so in terms of the time... <laughs> Sorry, no, no questions yet, Scott. Um, uh, the the, the um, work that I'm going to describe today is work that um, involves um, trying to understand cellular function um, and, and aspects of um, cell variation through subcellular genomics. So, so this is a single cell meeting, but I'm going to show you data from the work that I've been doing in collaboration with Zhen Yang and others to try to understand genomics at the level of subcellular resolution. So um, I, it's important to show my colleague and friend, Jun Young Kim. Jun Young is a computational biologist. And I like showing this and describing um, the difference between a computational biologist and a bioinformaticist. For me, a computational biologist is somebody who teaches you French literature, whereas a bioinformaticist will teach you the French language. So that's a distinction that's important for us, because we plan experiments, we do experiments, analyze experiments, and then do better experiments in this back and forth. So those of you who are experimentalists, web bench experimentalists, you need good computational biologists to work with you. A computational biologist, hopefully you have good experimentalists who can provide good quality data. <coughs> so these are my disclosures, so you're aware of my potential biases. So the first description of a cell was by Robert Hooke. Um, and um, 
this was written in a Royal Society monograph called Micrographia, published in 1665. It was a scientific bestseller. There were 2,000 copies printed and sold out within a year. And um, the original language of science was Latin. And so this was written in Latin. And so this is a translation of this. Um, and the translation was actually done by my son, who's a classicist. So it was nice to actually work with him on this. And using the microscope that you see on your right, um, Hook was able to describe these pore-like structures in cork that he called cells. Over the course of subsequent 150 years, lots of data was generated, modern cell theory was elaborated, and I would argue that every aspect of biological science evolves from this idea of a cell as an entity in and of itself that divides and functions and can replicate. So in terms of single cell biology, the types of things that we'd all like to assess, so some of us are assessing particular components of this, are um, genomic DNA sequence and DNA variation, chromatin dynamics, single cell epigenomics, and you can read these. One of the most important ones is single cell functional genomics, but I'm not going to be able to describe any of our efforts on this, but hopefully next time we'll be able to show you some of the work on this, which I think is critically important. Some of these technologies are very well developed and easy, like single cell transcriptomics. Others of these technologies are more difficult to implement and need a lot more technology development. Um, what I'm going to show you, though, are some of our efforts at looking at subcellular um, uh, biology in terms of chromatin dynamics and subcellular transcriptomics, partitioning of RNA into subcellular compartments, and, and some of the organelles that we're analyzing. This all gives rise to this idea of cellular phenotype. So if you ask your neighbor what he or she thinks cellular phenotype is, it's going to likely be different than your definition. Is it the transcriptome? Is it the proteome? Is it the metabolome? Is it function? If it's function or any component of that, is it for a cell at 10 in the morning or 10 at night? Or is it for a cell that's 10 years old versus 70 years old, which can be for a human neuron? So it's those complexities that make it very difficult to define what cellular phenotype is. A transcriptomic phenotype is not necessarily a cellular phenotype. It's a, transcri it's a cellular transcriptomics phenotype. So the distinction, I think, is an important one that one has to keep in mind. And so I'm going to show you this data both in situ and in vivo um, for the types of things that we're interested in assessing. So in terms of the cellular chemicals that we'd like to be able to assess, so this is a neuron, we'd like to be able to look at RNAs, metabolites, proteins, functional pools of RNA, genomic DNA sequence, and all those different things within the cell that, that give rise to the functioning of the cell. Further, though, in, in addition to the chemicals that we'd like to be able to detect and quantify, we'd like to be able to look at biological processes, such as translation, transcription, splicing, um, degradation pathways, um, and those that utilize the chemicals and manipulate them to give rise to the biological functioning of the cell. So we'd like to be able to detect those and quantify those in individual cells. So ideally, we'd like to be able to do all of it. So that's really the ideal goal for many people, uh, not just our lab, is to be able to do all of these simultaneously for any cell. Of course, we're not there yet. But the progress that we've made since the first um, offering of this workshop has been staggering, and I think we're going to continue to make very rapid progress. This is all complicated by the fact that there are subcompartments. So for a neuron, we have these dendrites, and you might have different RNAs localizing dendrites versus the cell soma. You might... We also have the soma, we have the nuclear compartment, and we have some subcompartments within those structures in terms of ER and Golgi and, and secretory vesicles and, and so on and so forth. So it's that type of subcellular localization that we're trying to assess quantitatively to try to understand how cells function. So for me, I'd like to be able to do every one of these assessments by DNA sequencing sensitive, it's reliable, and so there are a number of different ways in which one can do this. From the linear um, ARNA amplification procedure that allows us to detect RNA in cells, so this is the ARNA procedure, which is also known by CellSeq, also NDROP uses this amplification procedure. Uh, I'm going to show you a bit more about this RNA cargo characterization procedure. This is a protein detection methodology that I'm not going to describe today. And this is Leante that was developed by Sunny Z, which uses the linear RNA amplification protocol to sequence DNA. Um, one can do this for metabolites as well and other components of chemicals within cells. But I'm not going to show you any of that data. But I am going to concentrate on these a little bit later in the talk. 
So I'm going to show you something about fixed tissue spatial genomics, in particular chromatin analysis, which is shown here, in vivo transcriptomics, um, RNA binding protein dynamics. So first off, I'm going to show you some of um, how we think about subcellular localization based upon morphological structures. So as I said, we have the neuronal cell soma, we have the dendrites. Um, and so if we wanted to characterize the transcriptomic component or the metabolomic component or proteomic component of a dendrite, how, one, how might one do that? One way of doing this, and I'm sorry, this has been done in collaboration um, with, for our human work with Sean Grady. Sean is chair of neurosurgery at Penn. And we get human tissue, which I'll show you momentarily. In fact, we had the first IRB in the country where at the point of resection of tissue for neurosurgery, half the tissue comes to us and half the tissue goes to the pathologist. Normally, it all goes to the pathologist and then to the scientist. And by that time, it's actually way too late to be able to use that tissue. So using um, this very fresh tissue, we're able to do a variety of things that I'll show you momentarily. But um, again, I'm sorry for the resolution on this, but you heard a little bit from some of the other speakers about the dendrites, which are these fine structures here, on which in an axon will about to form a synapse. And it's that synapse where aspects of learning and memory presumptively occur, um, consolidation of memory. And every neurological disease, the first manifestation of disease etiology is atrophying of dendrites or axons. So there's biological importance to those subcellular structures. So we'd like to be able to understand them chemically and functionally. So the first way in which we did this um, is to be able to um, take primary neurons in culture. So these are mouse neurons. We can remove the cell soma mechanically with a patch pipette, and then we can aspirate an individual dendrite or multiple dendrites into the pipette and analyze the biochemical complement by virtue of that manual dissection. So this is a mechanical isolation, which is distinct from a chemical isolation, which I'll show you later. So this is some work of Sarah Middleton, who is a student in Jin Young's lab. This is one of the collaborative papers that Jin Young mentioned, um, where individual dendrites were taken from the cell. The RNAs were sequenced, and we can look at RNAs that are upregulated in dendrites versus those that are present in the cell soma, and in glean a variety of biological insights from this. You can also look for splice forms, you can look at different three prime UTRs, and we were able to identify a targeting sequence in the RNAs that allowed the targeting of RNA into these subcellular sites based upon single cell transcriptomics. Papers published, we have several papers on it, so you can look that up if you'd like. So that's fine, you can take the cells in culture, but those cells are independent of all the normal interacting cells, the other neurons and the astrocytes that are involved in normal cellular functioning. So that likely changes the molecular biology of the cell. So we'd like to actually be able to look at gene expression and cell biology in context of all the other cells in the natural microenvironment. And so it's sort of illustrated here. If this is an astrocyte, the neurons are in blue, we'd like to be able to look at these processes, likely dendrites, um, independently of all the other material within this, this um, section. And so, um, so we wanted to try to develop a way of doing this. So it all comes down to the process by which you are isolate RNA. If you want to look at RNA in a dendrite in vivo, how do you actually isolate that RNA so you can actually do your molecular analysis? So in terms of pools of cells from tissue, we're all familiar with all these different approaches that one can use. We've all done these multiple times. For cells in culture, you can use the patch pipette approach, which I showed you earlier. You can use FACS, the microfluidics approaches. For cells in fixed or frozen tissue, you can use laser capture microdissection, in situ transcription, which I'll come back to a little bit later, um, fish, um, which is like sigfish or merfish, and some of the other approaches like that, and then physic, which I think Jay Lee mentioned during his, his talk, and Jay was brilliant in his development of this in situ sequencing methodology when he co-developed this in George Church's lab. And then single cells in live tissue, including packed pipette isolation, where you can go into the tissue and pull out the cytoplasmic contents. There are pluses and minuses to doing that. We can discuss that later if you'd like. And then approach that we call TIVA, which I'll show you a little bit of data on. And then um, looking at, in fixed cells and another approach called TISA, which I'll show you momentarily. And so um, rather than using mechanical isolation, now what we'd like to be able to do to isolate the biochemical components that we're interested in is use spatially activated chemical isolation. Activate your chemical capture molecule at the site where you want to actually be able to assess it. So um, for um, TIVA, this is a compound that was made. This was published a couple of years ago. 
Um, and this was done in collaboration with Ivan Mahovsky. I'll briefly go through this. We have a poly U track that's base paired with two short regions of poly A separated by photoactivatable linkers. This is a Psi3 and a Psi5 cell penetrating peptide and a biotin molecule. And so this molecule, when it's annealed, when these A's are annealed to the poly U, you have a FRET signal between the fluorophores. Um, the cell penetrating peptide will allow this to go into cells, and the biotin allows one to capture this molecule once it's inside the cell. Basically what we do is the compound goes into the cell by the cell penetrating peptide. The natural reducing in the environment of the cell removes this because of the disulfide. We then hit this with light in the cell of interest. The photoactivatable groups break apart. The poly A's fall off. We lose our fresh signal, and now it can bind to the endogenous poly A plus RNA in the cell where it was activated. And so this is a cell that has a TIBA compound in it. We hit this with light of the right wavelength. It turns green because we've lost our FRET signal. And now that compound can capture RNA and in that one cell, in that live slice preparation. And so again, this was published a couple of years ago. And um, various details in terms of size of RNAs and things that can come out of it. Um, and, um, I want to emphasize that this is not a high throughput methodology at the moment. This is a low throughput methodology, but it allows you to go to individual cells and subregions of cells, which I'll show you momentarily, to gain biological insight. Oh. Sorry, I hope you didn't read that. <laughs> um, this is audience participation. So I saw Scott falling asleep a little bit earlier during the break, and so, so I want to make sure he stays awake. And he can't answer this because some of you have seen me do this before. But say you have a hippocampal cell that's dispersed out of the hippocampus and in culture. And you have a hippocampal cell that's in the slice preparation. You do transcriptomics on both of those. Which of those cells is going to expre express more genes? Do you think the, the cell that's been removed from the hippocampus is going to express more genes, or the cell that's present within the hippocampus is going to express more genes? Anyone want to guess? How many people think the cell that's been removed will express more genes? OK, well, you guys are. Good. The dispersed hippocampal cell expresses about 12,000 genes, and the cell that's in contact with its neighbors in the live slice preparation expresses 9,000 genes. So there are a number of different interpretations with, with respect to this, but one of the interpretations is that the endogenous connections act as an inhibitor of gene expression within that tissue to clamp gene expression. So the 12,000 genes that are expressed here are the total capacity of that hippocampal cell to function as a hippocampal cell. And then in different regions of the hippocampus, different um, sets of RNAs can turn on to provide special, specialized function. And, and I think I just mentioned this. So as I mentioned, we do get this human tissue at the point of neurosurgery. This is a very fancy and expensive device for bringing it from the operating room where Sasha sits until the tissue is taken out. It's handed to her directly by the neurosurgeon, and it comes to our lab. So within 10 minutes, it's in our lab and sectioned, and we're starting to do um, plating and experimentation on the tissue. And we now have, I think we have close to 12 neurosurgeons that are giving us tissue, and hopefully soon we'll have the Children's Hospital of, of of Philadelphia uh, providing uh, tissue as well. So these human neurons, so this is a human neuron that came from a 70-year-old adult brain. So we could take that tissue, disperse it, culture these neurons. You can't do this actually with adult mouse brains. You can't take a two-year-old mouse brain and get live neurons. We can record currents, and um, we've done many more neurons than this now. And among the things, I don't know if this will show, yeah. So these are cells in culture. We can stimulate with different types of, of, of reagents that will stimulate the neurons. And di certain neurons will respond to one or the other, or multiple ones. And so this is the physiological responsiveness of those cells to those particular reagents. So we can go to individual ones and do transcriptomics on those if we'd like. And so it's relatively straightforward to do this. Um, and we were able to identify a large number of different types of cells based upon the transcriptome. So this is the transcriptomics characterization of the cells. And so these are all the types of cells that we found in our cultures from this adult human brain. But the fact is that this compound is activated by light. So it goes into the cell, and then you activate it with light. And that allows you then to have the resolution to do subcellular activation. So here you can see that we've activated the compound in the 
um, cell soma. Here we've done multiple dendrites. Here we've done a single dendrite, and here we've done what's called a single dendritic spine. And so on that dendritic spine, then an axon will about to form a synapse. And so we can now go to those individual sites because we've done local chemically activated capture of the RNAs to try to identify what those RNAs are. So just, we've been waiting forever to get a couple more human cases to try to complete the study. But what this is is human cerebellar tissue. So this is a slice of human cerebellum. These patients presented um, actually with glioblastoma. We know these cells are normal by virtue of various molecular things that we do, but they present with glioblastoma. They're resected, and we can do slices through the cerebellum. And what you can see is that the compounds loaded in the cells, and when we activate just this one dendrite in the live slice, we can identify 533 RNAs. This dendrite in the slice, 398, this one didn't work. And so, um, so we can actually do the subcellular characterization, and then what, by virtue of the TIVA compound, annealing with the poly-A plus RNA, it has a biotin on it, we can pull that down using streptavidin beads or other procedures. And so um, that's how we can actually get the material from a subcellular region in live slices. So now moving on to another component of the biology that um, we've been working with now is we want to be able to look at RNA cargos and RNA association with RNA binding proteins. Every RNA in the cell is covered with RNA binding proteins. RNA binding proteins, I'll come to this momentarily, regulate all aspects of RNA biology and metabolism. So one of the questions for us is, if you have multiple RNA binding proteins in a cell, and you have RNAs bound to this RNA binding protein and RNAs bound to this RNA binding protein, if you stimulate the cell, do they switch? Do they come off the RNA binding protein, go into the transcriptome, and not bind to other RNA binding proteins? What are the dynamics of that subcellular movement of RNAs within cells? So um, one of the things that prompted us is our desire to be able to look at stress granules. Stress granules are components within a cell which upon times of stress, when a cell is stressed, various RNAs and RNA binding proteins go into this liquid droplet, basically, which, which is a stress granule. And when the stress is gone, those liquid droplets presumably dissolve, and the components go back into cytoplasm for normal activity. And there are papers suggesting that when that does not happen, when the dissolving of the stress granule does not occur, it can proceed to pr produce inclusions and potentially plaques and tangles. It may be a component of, of that type of neurological deficit associated with those diseases. So what we'd like to be able to do is go to individual stress granules and see what RNAs are in those individual stress granules and how does that change with different types of stress. So, um, So as I said, RNA binding proteins are involved in every aspect of RNA metabolism from its synthesis in the nucleus by RNA polymerase to its degradation in um, the lysosome and other structures within the cell. Um, and if you look at the mammalian genome, there's 600 RNA binding protein genes predicted. This is based upon motifs that RNA binding proteins share. But this is a gross underestimate. Every transcription factor that you work on in your lab will also bind to RNA, but it'll bind at a lower affinity. And so the question is whether or not they actually interact with RNAs in vivo and whether or not they elicit any function. But there are many more likely RNA binding proteins than those predicted by the known functional motifs. This is just an example of three of them, translin, poly A binding protein, which you can see out in the dendrite, HNRMPK, which is highly expressed in the nucleus, but also in the processes. And so there are many RNA binding proteins within cells, which coordinate the function and activity of those RNAs. So, how can we look at the in vivo RNA binding protein interactions in subregions of cells? So what we've done is we've adapted a procedure that we developed a couple of years ago to make this higher throughput. So this is called APRA, antibody position RNA amplification. And what we do is we take an antibody to the RNA binding protein of interest. We covalently attach through a variety of different procedures, including click chemistry, this oligonucleotide to this um, antibody. When you use this antibody for immunocytochemistry, it positions this oligonucle oligonucleotide close to the RNAs that are associated or near the RNA binding protein. So here what we're doing is trying to concentrate our oligonucleotide near where we think the RNAs or cargos are, our desired um, chemical entity that we want to detect. Um, so, so rather than the chemical isolation, this is a proximal isolation where we're trying to really concentrate our interrogator near the the chemical that we want to try to detect. So um, 
These are some of the features of this, which we can discuss later. A degenerate sequence is on the end, so it can basically bind to essentially any sequence um, that might be associated near the RNA binding protein. So basically, when you have an RNA binding protein, the antibody, and so this is in fixed tissue, so you do immunocytochemistry with the antibody that positions this oligonucleotide close to these RNA cargos. You then add reverse transcriptase in the presence of DNTPs. You do in situ transcription. So you make a cDNA copy of the RNA using this, this oligonucleotide as a primer, the oligonucleotide that's bound to the antibody. So now we have a cDNA copy of the RNA that we hope is an RNA cargo for the RNA binding protein. We can remove this from the tissue section easily, make this double-stranded, cut with restriction enzyme site, and amplify this material with T7 RNA polymerase. And so um, we've been involved in doing this for a number of different RNA binding proteins, but I want to show you a couple now. So it's targeted concentration as opposed to chemical isolation, as opposed to mechanical isolation. This is now targeted concentration for our isolation component. And so I'm going to show you data for two different RNA binding proteins. One is FMRP, the other is TDP43. We worked on FMRP for a number of years and had the first paper showing the large number of RNA cargos that could bind to FMRP uh, using this approach with the greatest number of confirmed cargos that have been described today, even more so than ClipSeq. Um, this is how we do the experiment. Um, Fragile X disease is caused by deficiency in FMRP. Um, TDP43 is involved in a number of different neurological illnesses. And so what we do is we currently attach the DNA to the antibody. We can then do immunocytochemistry, and we can see that um, the FMRP is localized where we expect it to be localized, even though we have the DNA attached to it. And over here, this is TDP43, and it's more concentrated in the nucleus of the cell, and that's what you see here, even though it has an oligonucleotide bound to it. So in one experiment, we can look at TDP43, FMRP. We can merge these, so this is in the same cell. So in one single cell, we do immunocytochemistry for FMRP and for TDP43. And we also then do cDNA synthesis using an oligonucleotide that looks at the transcriptome. So this is an oligo-DT with a T7 promoter on the end of it. So you hybridize that to the poly-A plus RNA. And so you basically have three different reactions ongoing. The APRA from FMRP, the APRA from TDP43, and the cDNA synthesis from the transcriptomic oligonucleotide that's done. And what we can see is approximately 4,000 RNAs that we can detect in the transcriptome of these cells, of an individual cell. These are the TDP43 predicted cargos. These are the FMRP cargos. And when we look at these cargos in some of the databases that have been published, we find a large number of them actually have been identified previously as FMRP cargos, including some of the ones that we've identified, but also others that others have identified with ClipSeq. Um, and we can discuss how this is essentially a single molecule detection methodology, but this is also essentially the minimum number of these proteins within the cell. And, and again, we can discuss that later if you'd like. The other thing that this does is by virtue of the orientation of the oligonucleotide and the fact that cDNA synthesis has to occur from the 5 prime, 3 prime direction in terms of the oligonucleotide, this also gives us uh, in information in terms of RNA binding protein sites within a, within a, and RNA structure within a cell. So the antibody binds, and you're always going to synthesize cDNA 5 prime to where the RNA binding protein is bound. So when you do this, um, this is just one example. This is a TDP43 cargo that we identified. Um, you can see the buildup of reads around here. And if you look just three prime to that, we have a canonical TDP43 binding site. So that suggests, it doesn't prove, but it suggests that that's a site that's used for binding to TDP43 that our antibodies detecting. And when we look through some of the other predicted sites using some of these programs, there are a couple of, of uh, sites that we believe are novel sites that we're in the process of confirming now with standard um, more standard assays. All right, so now moving on to um, another subcellular compartment. So rather than looking at the RNA in these subcellular pools in the cell, we'd also now like to go to the chromatin. You've already heard some really beautiful talks about chromatin analysis in cells. And so there are a number of different procedures for doing that. But what we want to be able to do is look at the chromatin landscape in fixed cells. If we can do that, then we can actually work with all these human fixed pathological tissue specimens for which you're never going to be able to get live cells and oftentimes not even frozen tissue so that you can actually do ATAC-seq or Duke-seq or things like that. So we'd like to be able to look at functional chromatin structure in identified cells 
Um, and so essentially it's spatial chromatin analysis. And among the reasons we like to do this is that the, the chromosomal localization within cells is very, varies from cell to cell. There's certainly discussion about where these genes are localized, the chromosomes are localized in the front, um, the um, landscape of those chromosomes might give rise to aspects of variability in gene expression. So there are a number of reasons to try to be, to, to be interested in this. You're all familiar with chromatin structure from the, the chromosome all the way down to the, the double-stranded DNA. And of course, you know that in the open chromatin state, um, DNA polymerase, um, RNA polymerase can bind and uh, make um, um, RNA from, from the um, open chromatin sites. So there's a lot that's been done biochemically to characterize this process, including a lot of it done here by Bruce Stillman in very classic papers dissecting the biochemistry of transcription. So um, what we decided to do was take advantage of the fact that there, there is a component of open chromatin that's single-stranded. So a lot of people um, have, have not um, looked at this, but there's a whole series of papers showing open chromatin. We know that there's open single-stranded chromatin around transcriptional bubbles. There's large open chromatin sites on the order of 80 kilobases estimated by some people around sites of, of DNA repair. And, and there are other open chromatin sites within, um, single-stranded open chromatin sites within, um, within the DNA structure. So um, there are a number of different procedures, some of which you've heard about um, to do single-cell chromatin analysis. Um, but what we'd like to be able to do is look at this in identified cells that are localized in their natural microenvironment. So to do this, we developed a procedure called CheckSeq, which is chromatin exposed um, sequencing. We want to be, these are the things that we'd like to, to have in this methodology as we develop it. And so we take advantage of the fact that there are regions of the genome that are single-stranded. Um, we also use a, uh, take advantage of the fixative. So what the fixative does, if it's a cross-linking fixative, is it cross-links the single-stranded DNA open so that it doesn't actually close. So then one can actually try to assess that through hybridization strategies. So to do this, we've made a, an oligonucleotide, we call it a DNA interrogator, that has various components in it, including this very important end. This is the three prime end. This is called a lightning terminator. So um, I became aware of this a few years ago when I heard a, about a company called LaserGen that was using the, and it developed this, this reagent. It came out of a lab at Baylor. And um, over the course of the next year and a half, Agilent bought them, and the next generation of DNA sequencers is going to actually be based upon this type of chemistry. But we wanted to use it for a different type of approach. So basically, when the, one of these nucleotides, and this is the one that we've used for our current studies, is put on the end of the oligonucleotide, this actually acts as a dideoxy. So the oligonucleotide is there, it can still anneal, but it can't act as a primer because it has this lightning terminator on the end, which is fluorescent. When we hit this with light, the lightning terminator goes away, and we have a free 3' hydroxyl. So we've activated that primer so that we can actually do, use it as a primer for DNA synthesis. And so the idea is in single-stranded areas, we can anneal this primer. We can then activate in an individual cell's nucleus, add DNA polymerase to make a DNA copy of the DNA template, using this as a primer, and then um, remove the material, amplify the DNA that was made because we have a T7 promoter on the end of that primer, make libraries out of it and sequence it. So when we look at some of the data, if you look at CheckSeq compared to the, uh, so we actually use the K562 cell line as for benchmarking of this technology. Uh, this is the ENCODE cell line. We chose it because there are literally thousands of databases that we can compare and monitor the robustness of our procedure against. Um, for what it's worth, it's actually, it's a terrible cell line and ENCODE should never have used it. But nonetheless, it's still the, the cell line that's there. When you look at the CheckSeq, so this is actually one of the 562 cells. The nuclei have the CheckSeq primer in them. We activate in this one nucleus. We then do DNA synthesis. We remove it from the tissue. In this case, it's a dispersed cell. We go through the, the amplification analysis, and you can see that we have a nice coincidence of many of our um, reads compared to the same genetic loci for um, these other approaches. One of the things I'd like to point out is for ATAC-seq, this is 
200 and I think 37 cells aggregates worth of material. And for CheckSeq, this is an aggregate of about 42 cells. So we have less cells, but we still have a pretty good correlation. Um, when you do clustering with a bin size of 50,000 bases, you can see the CheckSeq clusters nicely with ATAC seq DNA1 and fair seq fares a little bit off, but they're all very close. So there's a pretty good co coincidence of these methodologies, even though what we're doing is a single fixed cell. Um, when we look at the buildup of the TSSs, this is check seek. This is, again, I'm sorry about the resolution. I always hate doing this in front of Scott because he is all about resolution. And, and, and so maybe I do this on purpose when Scott's in the audience. But this is the ATAC seq data showing the transcriptional star site. This is check seek. Um, this is comparing CheckSeq to the transcriptome, single cell transcriptome that's been published for the K562 cell, and CheckSeq versus GrowSeq, which is essentially HNRNA, newly synthesized RNA. And you can see there's a vast overlap of the CheckSeq sites with these transcriptomics procedures. They're still independent ones. So there are RNAs that we don't detect open chromatin for and open chromatin sites that we don't detect RNA for, and there are a number of reasons for that. One of the things I want to highlight is up here. You can see for this chromosomal locus, ATAC-seq identifies this as open. DNAs1 only sees a couple of sites. FAIR-seq doesn't see this at all. CHECK-seq sees essentially the same thing as ATAC-seq sees. So each of these protocols have their pluses and minuses. They're not all showing you exactly the same thing. There's a coincidence of a large number of reads that overlap with these different protocols, but they are all distinct. So we wondered whether or not we could identify the site, and so we did the site-to hybridization over here. And one of the things I want to highlight is we have three spots. So this is chromosome one. This is trisomy in the 562 cells. So that's exactly what we would expect. And one of the things I'd like to highlight is this is not your standard in situ hybridization. We have not done any denaturation here because what we're expecting is to find single-stranded DNA that's open without denaturation. And so that's what we're detecting. And we have um, eight 25-mer probes that are annealed here to try to get the type of signal we'd like to be able to see. Um, there's some interesting aspects of the biology here in terms of, uh, in, in addition to a strandedness, so we can find more of the negative strand and the positive strand as one goes further down the length of the gene. There are a number of potential reasons for that, but there's some interesting biology that I think comes out of this. But now we want to be able to do this in fixed brain sections. So um, what you can see here, this is a mouse um, tissue section through the hippocampus. It's staying with an antibody to MAP2. We put our CHEX probe on, which is red. And what you can do then is identify an individual cell using immunocytochemistry. We can activate the nucleus in this one immunoidentified cell. So you can see the reduction in um, um, CHEX seq probe. And when we compare the um, in situ neurons versus the expressed transcriptome from single cell data sets and all of that, we find a tremendous overlap. It's, it's actually giving us a really good um, uh, overlap with those reads, even more so than actually the primary neurons. So in some other work, um, we're interested in other types of neurons, and we've been doing a whole host of other cells, but this one I thought I would show um, here, um, where we're interested in a particular type of neuron called an inhibitory neuron. And so different types of inhibitory neurons, they serve specific functions within the brain. And in this case, this is a parvalbumin inhibitory neuron. And so you can see that the cells are stained with MAP2. Um, this is a parvalbumin positive cell. So we can go to the individual neuron, which we know is a neuron, but because of the staining with MAP2, we notice an inhibitory parvalbumin cell because of this staining. And then we can activate that one nucleus in that tissue section. Do cDNA synthesis, remove the DNA, amplify it, and when we look at um, aspects of the genome that comes out, we find many of the inhibitory neurons that are characterized, characterized as enriched in inhibitory neurons are also enriched in terms of CHECK-seq um, um, single-stranded open chromatin analysis. So um, I'm showing you actually how CHECK-seq can actually do this half of, of, of um, the analysis basically looking at open chromatin status. But there's other aspects in terms of higher order DNA structure that CHECKC can also involve, help with that I'm not going to describe today, but hopefully in future talks we'll be able to do so. So basically that allows you to do 
spatial, transcript uh, spatial chromatin analysis. And for those of you who are thinking about the technology, there's also a very easy way of combining this with the transcriptome in the same cell. We, I have to say we haven't done it yet. We've been working really hard to get the check seat to move forward, but there's some very easy ways of, of multiplexing this that we will be doing over the next couple of months. So now moving from that subcellular structure of the nucleus, now we want to look at some of the other structures in the cell. And so I'm going to show you actually some of our work on mitochondria. So as you think about cell function, there are a number of different subcellular structures, um, stress granules, uh, other types of cohol granules and other things, the ER, nucleus, mitochondria. And, and I had this discussion with David yesterday at the bar about emergent properties. You take a mitochondria, you take an ER, you take these things, mix them together, you do not get a functioning cell, likely. <laughs> But when you mix them together as they are biologically develop in that one contained cell, you actually get a functioning cell. So the emergent property, the function of that cell is more than the sum of its parts. And it's that type of behavior, that type of biology we want to, we want to try to assess. What gives rise to that emergent property? And so there are a number, and so again, all of you are actually involved in this already, doing single cell transcriptomes, single cell chromatin analysis, proteomics analysis. Those are all components of what gives rise to the function of the cell. But we also now want to be able to do this at the organelle level. And so um, you saw a picture of this earlier from one of the other speakers. Um, this is a picture from a textbook of the mitochondria. We're all used to thinking about this as the powerhouse of the cell. It does more than that. One of the things that I like about textbooks that are a few years old, including a decade old, just as this course is, is that they're often wrong. And this, this image is wrong because they have one, one circular DNA associated with the mitochondria. And an individual mitochondria can have one circular DNA or it can have many circular DNAs. So it's actually quite complex in terms of this genomic composition. Um, and mitochondria actually move in terms of neuronal functioning two um, synaptic areas that are active. So you can see mitochondria at this site and here. So one of the questions for us is, are the mitochondria that move to the synapse in response to stimulation um, and the need for energy for local protein synthesis, are they different than the mitochondria that are present in the cell soma? Or are they the same? And is that difference, would that difference be reflected in genomic SNVs? And so we can take our cells, neurons in green, astrocytes in red, or astrocytes over here, and we can stain with a vital dye that allows us to see the live mitochondria. So you can see large numbers of mitochondria in the astrocytes and in the neurons, and you can see mitochondria in these dendritic areas of the neuron. So um, the other thing, just in terms of uh, mitochondrial function, we can actually look at calcium waves over mitochondria and show that the mitochondria actually respond differently to different types of stimuli in terms of calcium uh, wave responses, calcium responses, suggesting that they are functionally distinct or can be. So um, the genome um, for the mitochondria is small, but it is circular. But being small makes it easier for us to analyze. And mitochondria exhibit, exhibit heteroplasmy, which is one of the reasons we want to do this, in that different mitochondria within a tissue can have different nucle nucleotide sequences. Those, um, that heteroplasmy develops over time. Uh, there are a number of different ways in which this heteroplasmy can likely develop. But when you get too many mutations in a mitochondria, you can develop disease. And, um, and you can actually get cell death and a whole host of different things associated with, with this type of SMB development. So in terms of single mitochondria data, we took advantage of the fact that mitochondria are present in dendrites. So we can actually visualize an individual mitochondria. Here in the cell soma, we really can't do that easily. We can identify an individual mitochondria and take our patch pipe pet and go down to that individual mitochondria and isolate it. So this is going back to mechanical isolation. And pull that into the pipette. And we can then sequence it using a protocol that we developed, which I'm not happy with, but it worked for this first paper at least. And um, when we did these, I think, 10 different mitochondria from this human neuron, so this was a uh, human neuron from, I think, a 60 60-year-old patient that was in culture for a couple months. And you can see this nice dendritic arborization. We have individual mitochondria. We isolated these. We sequenced them. And we can look for the presence of SNVs within um, um, the mitochondria. One of the things that we really wanted to do, well, let me, I'll get to it momentarily. 
So there are a number of aspects, I'm just going to speed through this, a number of aspects of uh, mitochondrial genomic biology that comes out of these individual mitochondrial studies and a number of different types of mutations. What we'd really like to be able to do, though, is sequence every mitochondria from the cell, not just 10. If we can sequence every mitochondria in the cell, then we might be able to look at the real differences in, in mitochondrial um, DNA um, sequence between the different um, um, mitochondria within the cell. How do different cells vary from one, from one to the other? And there's now a literature where cells can transfer mitochondria from one cell type to another cell type. So we know astrocytes can transfer mitochondria from the astrocyte into a neuron, into a dendritic area. Are those astrocytic mitochondria different than the neuronal mitochondria? Why, does, why, why doesn't that transfer occur? So we really want to be able to try to assess this. We'd like to be able to look at all the mitochondria. That's much harder than I ever envisioned. We're working with David Isidore and his group at Penn to develop high-throughput methodologies for doing that. And we're now at the point where we can get about 87 mitochondria from an individual cell, which is still below the two to 300 that we expect in our individual cells. But we're getting up there, and hopefully we'll do better over time. But David Isidore is an engineer, and it's been great to work with him. Um, and there's some aspects of, of presumptive evolution of, of, of these SNVs and the development of the SNVs from human to, to mouse that we can discuss later if you'd like. But it suggests different modes of, of, of inheritance, but we can't say that for sure. We don't have enough cells. And so in terms of cell organelles, you know, there are a number of different organelles that we'd like to be able to look at and are starting to look at using some other technologies I'm not even going to describe today. But the hope is that we'll be able to look at these subcellular sites in a quantitative manner to try to understand how they work in concert with one another to actually create that functioning cell. So I've shown you something about organelles and cytoplasm and RNA in the cytoplasm, something about the chromatin landscape. These other things are ongoing now um, and hopefully um, will be um, presentable soon. So, so I did do it in 45 minutes, um, but uh, this is my next to last slide. Um, and so, so it's cell dynamical states that give rise to multimodal biology. Now, to be able to look at how cells function, how, how the discrete components within the cell work together, it's all a dynamical process. In fact, I would argue that the best definition of a phenotype is a dynamical definition. And you know, it's an arguable point, but we can discuss that later if people would like to, like to discuss it. But in thinking about this, there are some aspects of our analysis that are very easy and some aspects of the analysis that are very hard. And I like this quote. This is Alice Munro. She's one of my favorite short story writers. She's a Canadian who won the Nobel Prize in 2013. And in a New Yorker interview, she um, made the statement, the complexity of things, the things within things, just seems to be endless. I mean, nothing is easy, nothing is simple. So I think that's generally true, even at the level of single cell, except for transcriptomics. That's easy. We have high school students doing that now. But um, other components of cell biology are quite complex. These interactions are complex. We need new technologies to assess the chemical complement of this, as many of us are doing, but also the biological complement in terms of how things function. And so figuring out how to assess these biologies in real time in a quantitative manner will be uh, hopefully something that we'll see at one of these meetings in future years. The most important slide is this slide. These are the people who've been involved in the project. Um, I described the single mitochondria work of Jackie Morris and um, Wa Zhu. And um, Jen Singh did the initial human work. Kevin Miyashiro has been involved in the APHR work. Um, and Jaehee Lee has been involved in the uh, CheckSeq work. We've done this in close collaboration with Jun Young's lab. And in Jun Young's lab, Yu Tao Lu has been involved in the CheckSeq analysis. And, um, and um, others in the lab have been involved in other types of projects that we've been ongoing that I haven't had, to describe, had a chance to describe to you. Jay and Sol is an associate professor in our department at Penn. He's a biophotonics expert, and we do much of our work in collaboration with him. We have a number of outside collaborators on various projects, and we benefited tremendously from the collaborative environment at Penn, where we're able to work with neurosurgeons, and we're able to work with chemists, and we're able to work with engineers to actually you know, employ their technology and their thoughts and their their ideas into the types of biological questions that we're interested in trying to assess. So thank you for your attention, and I'll try to answer any questions you might have.
your is this on? with your uh, RNA binding protein um, pull down. So I guess my understanding is the regions that are flanking RNA binding protein motifs usually are pretty variable in their secondary structure. And so if you have like a really complicated secondary structure with a lot of loops and double-stranded regions, and I'd imagine that degenerate sequence is going to have more difficult time binding there to prime the uh, reverse transcription. So right. I guess, yeah, how biased do you think that pull-down is for a secondary structure? In the slide that I showed, showing that there was an orientation to it where we always mm -hmm. said that there was actually a, a lower panel where we had a complex structure for the RNA, just as you said. Mm -hmm. Because you're right, RNAs all take on different structures within the cell, and this can actually define aspects of that structure. So in fact, I just fortunately had a grant funded to do just that, to try to assess the in situ RNA structures of cells using the idea that you just proposed. Yet everything that, all those structures will still be phi prime, to the RNA binding protein site, but not necessarily as close as the one that I showed you. And it may be impossible to define the RNA binding protein site if the structure is such that we're, we're detecting a sequence that's way down, uh, distant from it. Hmm? That's great. Um, sorry to, for the technical question, but how uh, broad is the multiplexing space of TIVA, and could you? Imagine patterning a whole field of view with barcodes and. Yeah, know, the, the TIVA is everything. particularly difficult to multiplex. Well, you can multiplex it in terms of looking at different things within the cell. So, this is that we can do with, with different barcodes, as you said. High throughput is particularly difficult with TIVA because we have to synthesize you know, those compounds yeah. that I showed you. We have a different compound now that we just got. Um, I guess on Monday, from our chemist friends, which is a completely different type of TIVA compound that, if it works, will make this a lot easier to, to, to do in higher throughput. But we haven't even tested it yet. It's just sitting in our freezer. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Scott, you don't get to ask questions. <laughs> no, uh, Non-Scott question. <laughs> Gosh, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, audience, No, uh, <laughs> for allowing me. So I'm very curious on the check seek about mm -hmm. the overlap that you were getting with the RNA and the chromatin accessibility. And it's great to see how good the correlation is. I'm curious if you think part of the disconnect is the fact that you're taking the uh, oligonucleotides that you're sequencing from different compartments. I'm assuming in one case it's nuclear, because it's checks. In the other case, it's the whole cell. And also that long non-coding RNAs would likely be differentially represented in those two different pools. So have you looked to see if the links are part of why that Venn diagram doesn't overlap more? So, so there are a couple of answers to this. So first of all, with that Venn diagram, we actually get more of an overlap than you see with ataxic. So we're getting more of an overlap with the, the RNA expressed genes than you see with the standard protocols. Yeah, we're not, yes, not I, 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 that's what I said. Okay. I'm impressed okay. with it all, but, but I'm also curious if there's a way we can they exploit that, yeah. the difference. You know, I don't know why we don't see more. Um, and I don't. What was your capture for the RNA? Was it one that would have captured uh, links, or was it, an, or was it in taking so, a so whole cell? I didn't show the check seek isolation of RNA. Mm -hmm. uh, I just showed for the chrom chromatin. Right. Um, but when we compared it to the RNA, it's basically for the presence of that RNA, basically right. sequence reads. Um, when we look at where the check seek reads are compared to, say, the transcriptional stop site, it turns out that in some preliminary data, it looks like as we get more sites closer to the TSS, those genes are generally expressed at higher abundance. You know, one might expect that, I think, from other work. Um, but the other thing is we're only getting DNA made in this case because we're using DNA polymerase, um, gene product A, um, and it's known to not have any reverse transcriptase activity. And, and so the RNA complement um, is not being transcribed in the cDNA in this case. If your question is whether or not long coding RNAs might be binding to the single-stranded DNA and blocking, uh, there may be some things like that happening, but... Um, I, I was wondering both ways, yeah. but yeah. 
Okay, I, but, but, I will now but, allow the rest of the audience to ask questions. But, 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 but it is one of the major distinctions to point out is that these other procedures rely upon double-stranded DNA yes. for transposon insertion and, and things, whereas what we're doing is the single, single-stranded component, and so there are going to be distinctions. Yes. And, and we know some of them, we certainly don't know all of them. Hey, Jim, way back here. Mm -hmm. uh, great talk, and uh, congratulations on your vision being the, the father of single cell. That's amazing. <laughs> but I, I, I was uh, struck by the amount of uh, heteroplasmy you were seeing in the mitochondrial DNA. Um, so you showed a bar graph, but it went really fast. It, uh, so if you, if you sequence four or five mitochondrial DNAs in a cell, uh, they'll, many of them have different sequences? Is that their? So when we find the SNVs, they're, they're, they're um, discrete. It's not like we have large numbers of mutations around the mitochondria. But no two mitochondria will be exactly alike. They're, they're um, in, in general, I, I should step back. They're, there are mitochondria that have the canonical sequence. So, so let me step back. There are only a subset of them that have the SNVs associated with them. And, um, and so the bar graphs that you were seeing were just where the SNVs were. It didn't show um, um, the totality of the, uh, of the mitochondria that we assessed. The paper's published, and so, so I'm happy to, to uh, send so, that to you. So are many of these mitochondrial DNAs now non-functional, uh, carry a, a, you know, a mutation that would no, mess the, up a, a coding most of, gene? Most, most of the mutations we saw would not um, alter the functioning of the, of the gene product. There okay. are some that would. There are some that in, in, induce stop or provided stop codons and, 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 and changes in amino acids that up on modeling would suggest that, that the protein would, would be dysfunctional or function differently anyways. Yeah, yeah, uh, but well, we haven't proven it. So uh, let me just finish. The, the one thing that we've been trying to do with some of our mass spec friends is based upon one of the mutations that we saw that have occurred at very high frequency is trying to do mitochond sequencing of that mitochondrial protein by mass spec. And we haven't succeeded yet, and um, the hope is that we'll be able to identify it that, that way and show that, that um, some aspects of its function. Do you think the germline mitochondrial DNA is protected somehow from uh, this high mutation rate? My last, my last part of this long question. Yeah, you, you know, it, it's, it's possible. We believe that there are different types of evolution of the mutation rate in um, humans versus mouse. We need many more mitochondria. And so I, I really would hesitate to speculate too much. Uh, then, I mean, let's thank uh, Jim again. <laughs> thank, thank you very much, Jim.